one night left, uh, tomorrow night, tonight, so two nights, but uh, tonight I've got a very short message for y'all. I know y'all are going to be glad of that. Amen. Now I'll tell you again, if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelations. Book of Revelations will be the last book in the Bible. If you know where it is, you've got trouble. Revelations chapter 20. Young boys, barracks. Make some noise on the count of three. One, two, three. Little girls, barracks, count of three. Make some noise. One, two, three. Big boys, barracks, count of three. Make some noise. One, two, three. I like the face. Big girls, barracks, count of three. Make some noise. One, two, three. One, two, three. Now it's my turn. Praise the Lord. We've had a good time in the Lord. We, we preach Sunday night. We, we preach about the deception that the devil wants to do in your life. He wants to deceive you. How many remember Sunday night with the coat? Yes. And the wire? That's right. Monday night we preached on the, the ten uh, virgins, five wives, and five foolish. Last night we preached on the true heart of worship. And tonight we're, we're going to look at a topic that's not very popular. Uh, a lot of preachers don't like to preach. It's not fun to listen to. It's not easy to think about. Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse number 11, says this. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was no place found, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which was called the Book of Life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I, I was leaving last night and, and we, we preached on worship and, and as I was reading, you find the strangest things in, in church and and I found this. Does anybody know what this is? This is Gabba. One day God himself is going to step into the, the arena as judge. Each and every one in here will give an account. The arena will be full. It will be packed with multiples and multiples and multiples and multiples of people who were not ready to be the judge. As the judge enters in, uh, to a courtroom, I worked uh, corrections, and part of my time working with corrections, I got the hall inmates uh, to and from court, and so I spent a lot of time in court. And everybody's kind of seated and relaxed, and, and it's a little chit-chat going on. And then from out in the corner, you're all rise, and everybody jumps to their feet. And then they mention the honorable judge's name who will be presiding over the case. And then the judge looks around with authority and says, you may be seated. And then they proceed with the court case. And this is what the, the scene in Revelation that John is giving us. They're proceeding with the court case. And, and each and every person, all the people that have died, are going to stand before God one day and give an account. Life is, is full of choices. Some choices are, are very easy to make. Easy choices. You go to the grocery store and you make a choice. Do I want a Snickers or do I want an M&M? Do I want a plain Coke or do I want Coke with cherry? Some choices are really easy to make. Simple to make. And you don't even have to put thought into the choices you make. And then there's other choices that, that we need to put a thought into. Choices like, where am I going to go to college at? You need to think about this choice. It's a big choice. It's a big step in life. And I know a lot of people, uh, young people, just 
graduated from college and just got out of college, and, and it was a big choice. It was a big step on where they was going to go to school. Who you're going to marry, another big choice. It's not something you just want to walk into lightly. It's something that you're going to be in with the rest of your life. Choices. These are our big life-changing choices. How many children are you going to have? You're going to have any choices. These are these are our choices. But the greatest choice, the greatest decision that you will ever make is the choice for Jesus Christ or for not Jesus Christ. The choice of salvation. You will never encounter a more important choice in your entire life. Ever. Because see, this choice, the balances of eternity is weighed in this choice. And this choice is literally heaven or hell. And it's all about the choices that you make. And you might be here tonight and you might say, you, you know what, I, I, I want to go to heaven and I, and I want to choose salvation, but, but not now. And if you're in this category, you've made a choice. And as we watched on the God's Not Dead movie this afternoon, that professor was uh, trying to get his life straight, and he was going back to get his girl, and, he, and, and everything in life, he, he was getting ready to turn things around, and he, and he walks across the street, the light was green, and all of a sudden he gets ran over by a car. He was lucky that God showed him mercy, that he could have another choice, another chance to make the right choice. But there's countless people that, that never had that chance. And, and my mother, back about 15, what's well, been 14 years ago, she she uh, was having some heart complications. And my mom always said, I, I want to be one of those persons that just gets saved, uh, was going to wait to get saved right until it was time for me to go and then I was going to get saved. She was just going to wait. And that's what her thinking was. And that was her mentality of, of salvation was. And... and and we took her to Evansville because she was having some heart trouble. And they admitted her to an ICU, and it was, it was a, a, a big deal. And then they screamed out, code blue, code blue. And it was my mom. It was my mom. And she died. And they brought her back to life. But when she, she came back to life, I, I, I went into her. And and she looked at me and she said, I never had an opportunity. She said, when my heart stopped, I never had an opportunity. It's a lie of the devil to think that you've got another opportunity. One night, when the uh, judge walks into the room uh, with his gavel, all opportunities are over. Finished. What is it to be lost? And in the Christian realm, to be lost is to be without Jesus Christ as your, your Lord and Savior. You see, there's a lot of people that will say a lot of things, uh, convince you that you can live a lot of ways and make it to God. But Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You believe Jesus Christ to be telling him the truth or, or you don't. That's a choice. The most important choice you'll ever make in your entire life. Imagine if you were in the middle of a massive uh, woods, and in these woods are all kinds of dangers. It's dark, it's lonely, you're afraid, and you're lost. If you don't have Jesus Christ in, in your life as your Lord and Savior, this is your very much your condition. Now, my question for you is. What would you do if you were in the woods and you heard someone walking through the woods? You'd go screaming, hey, I need help. I need help. I, I'm lost. I need help. I, I can't get out of here by myself. It's impossible. I've walked around for days, and yet many people walk for days, weeks, months, Years denying the salvation that's offered to them. Amen. Freely. Correct. Right. 
The price has already been paid. The victory has already been won. And people deny the cost. Each and every night in, in, in our barracks, the, the big boys' barracks, we, we go through a ritual. And then if we started the first night, you tell your name. And then we ask you, saved, unsaved, or uncertain. And, and everybody tells their name, where they're from, they can give their salvation, whether they're saved, unsaved, or uncertain. I want to tell you tonight, campers, you can be certain of your salvation. You can be certain that Jesus Christ will come into your life, but that he's not going to reject anyone while there's time. A few years back, my wife and I had uh, the great opportunity to meet a man by the name of Don Piper. Anybody know Don Piper? He wrote 90 Minutes in Heaven. Fantastic book. And if uh, the adults are out of it, get it and read it. And so we went and we watched him speak and, and after he was done uh, preaching, I had the opportunity to go back and, and visit with him. And his the testimony is fantastic. He, he got killed in a, in a car wreck. And it was a massive car wreck. He got ran over by a semi, and the semi hit him so hard that it literally knocked about four inches off of his uh, femur bone, completely out of his body, into the lake, and they never found it. And he walked with a limp today because one of his legs is short. A preacher was driving by. He had just left a preaching convention, and then one of the preachers was driving by, and the car was... That the car was tarped, getting ready to be loaded on the back end of the trailer. And if you, the reason the car was tarped because they couldn't extract them using the jaws of life on the scene because it was just too much, and they didn't pronounce them dead. And this preacher stopped by, and, and God was dealing with me. And I want to tell you, I take my hand off to this preacher because what he did took some nerves, and, and God was dealing with him. He said, uh, "Go up there and pray for the guy in the car." He went and talked to the, the, the highway patrolman. I think it was Louisiana Highway Patrolman. He said, I, I, I need to uh, go and pray for the guy in the car. And uh, the patrolman said, your prayers won't do no good. He's dead, been dead. He's been, been pronounced dead. We can't even get him out of the car. He's been pronounced dead. He's been dead about 90 minutes. And so uh, the patrolman said, go ahead. Just don't get hurt and don't get in the way. And so this preacher, the only way that he could reach uh, Don Piper was to crawl through the back seat of the car and he could reach his arm over and he could touch his shoulder and that's all he could get on, on Don Piper. And so he reached his arm over, he touched his shoulder and he, and he began to pray. And, and he said, God, I know you told me to stop and I know you, you told me to pray and I know, and I know it was of you and I know it was from you. But he's dead. And the preacher said he prayed all that he knew to pray. And he prayed as much as he knew to pray. And then he just started singing. And I don't know what song he was singing, but he mentioned the song. And then let's just say for fun, what a friend we have in Jesus. And the preacher said, I had my hand on his shoulder. And he was singing, what a friend we have in Jesus. And about that time, Don Piper said, oh, <laughs> He was alive. But the story is, yeah, yeah. But the most awesome part of that story is, is the 90 minutes that he was spent in heaven. And I'll never forget the look in the uh, his face, when, when my wife and I went, I took a book up to him to have him sign it, and I read it a couple of times, and, and, I, and I bought several books just to pass out. Uh, when my wife and I went to see him, he looked me dead in the eyes, and he said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm, I'm a preacher. He said, oh, keep on preaching. <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes we, we as preachers need to hear that. Exactly. And, and he said, uh, heaven is for real. He said, I was more alive those 90 minutes of my life than I've ever been. And he said, when he got ushered into heaven, 
It was like a great big welcoming committee of everyone that he knew in his life. Everyone was there. Mm. He said, his grandma was there. He said, grandma wasn't uh, all stooped over and old and wrinkled. He said, she was Cherokee. And he said, you know how Cherokee mm -hmm. women wrinkle? She wasn't wrinkled like that. She was perfectly straight and she looked good. And he said, I knew it was grandma. And he mentioned different ones that had died and went on. And there they was. And he, and he said, the amazing thing was is it was all about me. Because I made it. And he said in heaven, when, when one angel would say, or someone would just get excited and say glory to God over here, he said, then over here someone else would say glory to God. Or someone might start in a song right here, and someone might start in another song over here. And he said, down on earth, you could start three or four hundred different songs and it sound total chaotic. But in heaven, it's beautiful. Mm. And then he said he remembers his body being pulled back into the car and he remembers singing. <laughs> and there was this guy singing. Heaven. That, that's the place that we want to make him in. In, in heaven, it's a place of no sickness, no sorrow, no pain, no goodbyes. It, it, it's a place where, where everything is joyful. The colors are more vibrant. You don't have to take a nap because you don't get tired. <laughs> Heaven is a place where you get to see Jesus Christ sitting on his throne. We got the opportunity to go to the ocean. I've been to the ocean several times. And going through the ocean, we get to go over the mountains. And going over the mountains, each and every time we go over the mountains, we think about all the wonderful things that God has created. Imagine what heaven's going to be like. We can't even fathom what he's created up here. He's got... He's got uh, creatures up there that's got six eyes and eyes all over their bodies and six wings and he's got creatures that just do nothing but praise and worship him continually. And as much beauty as we see here on this earth because our earth is beautiful. Imagine what heaven's going to be like without the curse of sin on it. How perfect it's going to be. How lovely it's going to be. How exciting it's going to be. Hey, man, that's enough to raise your hand, Mary, and get excited about it, because that's what heaven is. And you see, we're all on a journey somewhere. But it wouldn't be fair to you tonight to just tell you about heaven without telling you about hell. Because a few years back, I was invited over to uh, John's house. He had a weenie roast in the camp out. I think he may even had a hay ride. I don't remember. but And he had some of his church there. And, and I'm standing by the, the, the campfire because if there's a fire, I'm just standing watching it. I don't know why. That's what I do. I just watch fire. And I'm standing by the fire and, and watching fire. And a young man, probably 18, maybe 19 years old. How many 19-year-olds do we have in the house tonight? You got to stand up. 19 years old. In case you're wondering, that's what a 19 is, what you're going to look like a 19. Probably you guys will never be that good looking, but 19 years old. That's right, you will be. But listen, I'm standing there, a 19 year old boy approached me, and he looked me in the eyes and he said the exact same thing, almost, that Don Piper told me. He looked me in the eyes and he said, Preacher, Hell is real. And when you're looking at a fire and it's dark outside and you have a stranger come up to you and say, Preacher, hell is real, and you get your attention. <laughs> and so he had my attention. And I said, You've got a testimony. He said, Yeah. He said he was hooked on uh, methamphetamines and had been a uh, meth addict for quite some time. And one of the side effects of methamphetamines is it makes you real paranoid. And he said one night that he was uh, extremely paranoid. He felt like the police were at his door, and he said, they'll never take me. And so he ran, runs to his medicine cabinet, and no one was home, by the way. He runs to his medicine cabinet, and he grabs all the pills that he could find, and he starts drinking the pills. And he said, preacher, do you know where hell is? And I said, Roger, and he 
before I can even do that. He said, it's in the center of the earth. I've seen it. I've been there. He said after he took the pills, he watched his body fall in. Now, I don't know about you, but that's enough to get my attention, but that's enough just to freak me out. He, wa he said he watched his body fall in. And he knew it was dead. He said, I looked around for what seemed like to be a very long time, just checking things out. And he said, and then the four demons came. And they began to drag him to the center of the earth. And I'm looking at the fire, and I'm looking at him, and I'm not liking this very much because, hey, it's creepy, it's eerie. And he's telling this as a matter of fact. He's got a first-hand account of a place that, that I don't even want to dream about going. And uh, he says, they keep pulling me down to the center of the earth. And he said, I've never been more alive in my entire life than when I was dead. The emotions are more real pictures, the scene, everything is more real. And I said, what did you feel? He said, one thing. He said, one thing, and I still fear it, uh, feel it today. He said, the only thing that I felt down there was total, complete darkness and fear. He said, it's not like fear of watching a scary movie. He said, it's like a fear that you've never, ever experienced. He said, just fear. Huh. And he said, it was down there. And he said, uh, you could hear the screams and torments of souls that were burning in this fire. Souls burning in this fire, the pain of, of hell. And so, souls that have been there for centuries. Burning. And, he, and tears started welling up in his eyes, and he said, I thought it was going to be there forever. And back up on top of Earth, Nan had come in the house and found him and called 911. And the ambulance shows up, and they begin to give him chest compressions and pump his stomach. And while he was in hell, he screams out, Jesus. Save me. Mercy flowed to him. So immediately I was back in my body and I knew I had another chance. Another opportunity. How very fortunate. But that's a testimony that I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life thinking, can you imagine waking up in the middle of the night with the screams, with the torment, with the pain, and the stench? He said, the smell was awful. The funny thing about heaven is in Revelation, I think it's chapter 13, maybe. Revelation 21. 21 to 16. It gives the dimensions of heaven. The New Jerusalem, the great city of New Jerusalem where I want to spend my home. And, and in our terms, it's about 1,380 miles long, wide, and tall. 1,300 miles. That's the size of heaven. 1,300 miles tall. I mean, it's going to be big, and it's going to be awesome, and it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be one of the greatest things that we could ever imagine seeing. But Isaiah 5 and 14 tells us the size of hell. It says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself 
and opened her mouth without measure. Hell is without measure. Each and every day that we live, each and every day that we read, we take for granted so many times, especially if we take our salvation for granted because people are slipping off Amen. into hell. Mm -hmm. That's right. One of the most horrible things that I've ever witnessed was family members watching their loved ones stand before the judge as the judge is getting ready to pronounce his sentence guilty the family members weep the convicted person weeps because they know separation is coming Tonight, if I could have all, all the, the camp counselors and preachers, I need you guys to come up here. Just line up right through here. 